Okay, good evening, everyone, to Rocket Summer, a NSS space forum. I am the temporary host uh, for the evening uh, until our actual host is able to get his internet connection restored. And let me pull up a few slides I would like to uh, share with you by way of introduction. So tonight, Rocket Summer is all about the activities. Really, uh, the inspiration for this panel was the activities this month of Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and what we thought might be uh, some SpaceX uh, activities based on some statements they had made uh, a few months back, but those dates have slipped. And the participants this evening, uh, we are all members of the NSS Space Ambassadors uh, Program. So each of our ambassadors will be focusing on one of the three companies. Loretta Hall will be talking about Virgin Galactic. Casey Steadman will focus on Blue Origin. Uh, Bruce McKenzie will be reporting on SpaceX. And I will be moderating the discussion and fielding questions from uh, you, our audience. So please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask any questions that you may have about either these three companies or more broadly, the commercial space field or the field of space tourism. Now you can learn more about the Space Ambassadors program on the NSS website. If you go to space.nss.org, you can click on the Get Involved link that's on our menu. And on the submenu that opens, click the Space Ambassadors option. And that takes you over to our main Space Ambassadors page. And if you go down below the blue Donate to the Space Ambassadors program button, uh, there's an, an accordion full of information about the program and a couple items here you might be interested in. If you are looking for someone to come and speak to your organization about space, uh, you can click on the Space Ambassador speaker list to access a list of our speakers and the topics that they do speak on. And you'll get a, a bio uh, of that person, uh, if you click on their name, a bio, a list of their topics, as well as a list of their current presentations. And then to actually request a space ambassador, you would click on our space ambassador contact form link. And this link is also present on each space ambassador page and you'll just fill out the form and submit it. Now, before we begin, I would like to say a few words about technology and innovation. And this was in response to some recent editorials I've seen that have been kind of trash talking space tourism and saying it's just something of an ego boost for billionaires. So on this forklift here that you see in the picture is an IBM hard drive from 1957. This guy weighs more than a ton and it holds a whopping five megabytes of information. Now, the smartphone I've got here in my pocket um, has 64 gigabytes. So let's assume there had been no innovation, no market expansion, no economies of scale. If that were the case, my phone would weigh over 13,000 tons and I'd be paying almost $400 million a month for the storage that I have on that device. But because there is innovation, there is market expansion, and there are economies of scale, access to digital storage is no longer limited to governments and large corporations. It's been democratized. And many pundits and even industry professionals uh, have been very slow to see the opportunities 
and benefits of the deployment of new technologies. Uh, I find this quote here to be an excellent example of this type of short-sightedness. And this quote from 1961 by the commissioner of the FCC, who was a trained professional engineer, uh, demonstrates how we all too frequently underestimate the value of new technologies and how quickly new technologies build on those new technologies and lead to revolutions uh, that we just did not anticipate. Now, as you listen to each of our ambassadors' presentations, uh, I'd like you to keep this list uh, of characteristics in mind and think about the broader implication of each company's activities. And up here, this diagram is a modified Porter's model. You can do a, a internet search on Porter's model to get a more complete explanation of what this type of model is meant to illustrate. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Loretta Hall, who will be speaking to you about Virgin Galactic. Okay, Loretta, I have stopped my screen sharing. And I, <clears throat> I am sharing mine. Is it working correctly? Yes, it is. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'm just as brief. Um, introduction. Uh, you can read my bio in the, the publicity materials for this uh, presentation and also on the Space Ambassadors website. <clears throat> but I am um, an author of nonfiction books about space ex exploration, particularly human exploration. And as Jim said, I'm, I am a, an active space ambassador. The reason that I volunteered to represent uh, Virgin Galactic in this, in this discussion tonight is that I'm a taxpaying citizen of the state of New Mexico. So I've, that means I've been following Virgin Galactic's development for about 15 years now, uh, since we spent close to a quarter of a million dollars building a commercial spaceport <clears throat> with Virgin Galactic in mind as our anchor tenant. Uh, they, it took them a while to get into operation uh, with Virgin Galactic, <clears throat> but the spaceport itself has been in operation with other tenants uh, since about 2006 to varying degrees of, of activity. Um, and in fact, they've had about 300 uh, suborbital launches conducted from the spaceport in that since, since 2006. <clears throat> But uh, we are excited that Virgin Galactic is, is getting closer and closer to real operations. Um, and as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, <clears throat> Virgin Galactic flew its <clears throat> first fully crewed uh, flight this, um, on July 9th with a pilot, a co-pilot, <clears throat> and four passengers. So the way uh, Virgin Galactic got started, <clears throat> uh, it was an outgrowth of the Ansari X Prize competition, <clears throat> which was announced, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> by um, um, Pete, Pete uh, Diamandis back in 1996 as um, kind of a... Um, it was inspired by the Ortig Prize, which really launched uh, the era of commercial uh, aviation when um, Charles Lindbergh won the, the competition in 1927. And so Pete Diamandis put together a, uh, the, this X Prize competition to try and do the same thing for commercial space flight. So the requirements uh, for winning the $10 million prize were that a privately developed, uh, completely reusable spacecraft would have to fly above the Kármán line 
which is 100 kilometers or so about 62 miles of altitude, <clears throat> and um, that it would carry a pilot and two passengers, or for the competition, the ballast equivalent to two passengers, and that um, it would demonstrate its quick reusability by flying again um, and accomplishing that same um, altitude uh, within a two week period. So it, it took from the time that contest was opened in 1996 until uh, uh, September and October of, 19, of 2004 for someone to actually succeed in winning that prize. And that was Burton Rutan's um, uh, scaled composites company. And they did it with the vehicle that you see here, which um, is, is actually two vehicles. Um, there's, it's a, a, an aircraft with two outrigger uh, fuselages attached. And then the spaceship called Spaceship One was attached to the bottom of it. And at a given altitude, the spaceship was released and then it actually accomplished the, the required space flight. And um, <clears throat> I'll just mention at this point that all the images on my slides that I'm using tonight are from Virgin Galactic. So um, the, the technology that Rutan used to win that, pro that prize was a horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing type of um, uh, design. And when um, Richard Branson saw the, <clears throat> um, the success that Rutan was have, had had in, in one test flight, he decided that this, this was a concept that he wanted to try and <clears throat> expand upon in order to uh, develop space tourism. <clears throat> so he uh, signed on uh, with Virgin Galactic right before the first of their two test flights that actually won the prize for them and did it uh, through a company that he had registered called Virgin Galactic. And so <clears throat> the Virgin Galactic approach is a scaled up version of the, the design that won the Ansari X Prize. And so it, the carrier aircraft is now um, significantly larger. It actually has two airplane fuselages, um, which are connected with a common wing. And then the actual spacecraft is attached at the center of that common wing. And <clears throat> when the uh, company announced its goal of developing these vehicles, it initially um, intended or expected to be able to fly the vehicles for the first time by 2007. Well, um, that time slipped and slipped and slipped for various reasons. Um, after all, it is rocket science. And <clears throat> they first, <clears throat> the first of the test flights to actually reach space um, was <clears throat> flown in December of 2018. It was designed specifically for space tourism and also for um, research on short microgravity space flights. It carried, um, it's a larger version, of course, as I said, for, of the Spaceship One concept. So in this case, the spaceship called Spaceship Two is uh, designed to carry a, a pilot, a co-pilot, and six passengers and or research racks. It takes off from a runway, in this case, Spaceport America. <clears throat> uh, as you see it configured here, it flies up to an altitude of 45 or 50,000 feet and releases the spacecraft. And um, I'll, I'll describe the rest of the, the flight profile here in a, in a moment, but 
the pilot and the co-pilot of, of White Knight 2, which is the carrier aircraft, uh, fly in the, the right-hand fuselage. The left-hand fuselage is configured um, so that the interior is, is uh, mimics Spaceship One, so that uh, crew members and future uh, spaceflight participants can uh, use that as a training vehicle. So the, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the, the process is an air launch. And so when the um, mothership uh, gets to the desired altitude, it releases the spacecraft. And then very shortly thereafter, when the mothership is free and the spacecraft is ready to fly on its own, it ignites its uh, rocket engine. And I'll talk more <clears throat> about the engine, uh, rocket engine in a few moments. The, the mothership itself is actually powered by four Pratt & Whitney uh, standard airline type um, jet engines. The mothership and the spaceship are both uh, completely um, carbon composite construction. And that includes um, the entire aircraft <clears throat> and spacecraft. They're designed uh, to be, the mothership is designed to be able to fly up to four flights per day. It was uh, first flown in December <clears throat> of 2008. And up till now, it's flown um, something under 300 flights. Uh, this, um, the Spaceship 2, as I mentioned, uses a hybrid uh, rocket engine. And, and I, as I said, I'll talk about that more in a bit. The actual flight profile <clears throat> looks like this. And if you watch the flight on uh, July 9th, this will look a bit familiar. So the mothership takes off from the runway at Spaceport America, um, re releases the spacecraft, and it, it climbs very steeply up to its um, apogee, which um, <clears throat> in, the, in the case of the July 9th flight, that reached an altitude of 53.4 miles. So it satisfied at least one definition of space flight, which is <clears throat> the definition accepted by NASA and uh, the US military forces of being uh, at least 50 kilometers or, um, oh, excuse me, uh, at least 50 miles, 80 kilometers. Um, because it's a horizontal takeoff uh, launch, there, there's not the dramatic countdown to launch like there is in say the, the Virgin Galactic type flight, or excuse me, the uh, Blue Origin type flight that we saw on Tuesday. The uh, flight <clears throat> up to release of the spacecraft uh, takes about, uh, took 55, 55 minutes um, on the 9th. The rocket engine burns then for about a minute and uh, completes the rest of its uh, flight uh, turning upside down <laughs> uh, by the time it reaches the top. <clears throat> and the, the remainder of the flight takes a total of about 14 or 15 minutes. The, um, <clears throat> on the way down, after the spacecraft is, is above 99.5% of the atmosphere, the rear boom, uh, two rear booms on the spacecraft feather upward to a 65 degree angle, and that helps stabilize the spacecraft and also uh, slow it down on re-entry. And then it uh, glides to an unpowered landing back at Spaceport America, the same place it took off from. Um, I don't know if I just mentioned it or not, but the, the, the feathering uh, at, at about 50,000 feet, the feathering is reversed. So the booms go back parallel to the fuselage. The hybrid rocket engine um, was chosen because of, uh, for safety reasons. It is, um, it uses a nitrous oxide uh, liquid uh, for the, the oxidizer and then um, 
uh, plastic, essentially nylon, as the fuel in solid form. And um, initially, they were trying to use rubber um, as, a, as a fuel, but it, it didn't work out well enough. And they, they ultimately um, changed to nylon, which I believe was one of the factors that kept them from going uh, as hot, to as high an altitude as they initially intended, which would have been about 60, I think they even talked about 68 miles as a target altitude at one point. They, um, oh, let me back up a moment and talk about the uh, environmental factors. The um, carbon emissions, Virgin Galactic says the carbon emissions are about equivalent to um, what you would get with a business class ticket between London and New York. An independent analysis translated that into other terms and said it's about four and a half metric tons per passenger on, on a, a flight, which would be the equivalent of driving a typical car around the world. Uh, the, oh, the other safety feature of the engine was that um, it's designed so that with a single, closing one single valve, it can be shut off completely. And that also is for safety reasons. They just um, unveiled the third generation of the Spaceship Two model. <clears throat> it, the, the new model uh, will have, has a reflective skin on it as opposed to the, the more white skin of the, the model that you saw fly on the ninth. It's, uh, it's more modular in terms of its construction, which makes it quicker uh, to assemble and to service and maintain. Uh, it will, this model will start its flight tests, uh, glide flight tests at least later this year. And its target is to be able to fly 400 flights per year per vehicle. They're, they're in the, uh, close to completing a second one of this third generation model. The ticket prices for Virgin Galactic flight started off at $200,000 a seat and then rose to $250,000 a seat and uh, ticket sales are, are not, um, on, uh, tickets are not on sale at the present time. They uh, say they will resume ticket sales soon, but they haven't announced what the price will be, except that it most likely will be higher and probably significantly higher than the $250,000. Eventually, by the time they get into full operation and are flying very frequently, they're hoping to get it down to 50 or even $25,000. Uh, let's see. In addition to um, the suborbital flights, Virgin is, has um, developed a separate company called Virgin Orbit that is doing, using air launch uh, to uh, deploy satellites into orbit, small satellites. The, the mothership in this case is a modified Boeing 747-400, and it carries um, a rocket called Launcher One. Uh, the um, payload can be up to, um, be, well, between, um, let's see, 300 and 500 kilograms. It again is all cost, uh, carbon composite uh, construction, including the, the fuel tanks, which are have no liner other than the carbon composite construction, and that minimizes the mass. It's flown two successful test flights in which it deployed a total of 17 satellites, small satellites. And they're planning um, to be able to build 24 rockets per year. Um, at their Long Beach facility uh, to, to have um, uh, pretty frequent launch capability. And, it, and it's a very quick turnaround. They can um, get an order for launch and get the vehicle ready and launch it very quickly. And then uh, they have... Um, uh, Virgin Galactic now, back to the original company, is um, has just recent or a, a year or so ago released this concept design 
for a high-speed aircraft. Initially, they wanted to, um, they envisioned flying suborbital flights that would go point to point for very rapid transportation around the, the Earth. They have backed off from that and instead are planning to develop this high-speed um, aircraft which would use Rolls-Royce engines that are that they're working with Rolls-Royce to develop. It would carry between nine and 19 people, depending on how you configured the interior. It would fly at an altitude of 60,000 feet at a speed of Mach 3, which means they'd be able to fly from New York to London in about 90 minutes. The um, timetable for developing and uh, this vehicle is, has is not announced at this point. I don't think they know for sure how long it's going to take or even have a good idea. But in late 2020, it did pass a, a mission concept review by NASA. So it's slowly moving forward. And frankly, I have not kept track of my time. So I, <laughs> how am I doing, Jim? <laughs> Have um, I used my 10 minutes or? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. That's OK. I started talking That's and it. I can't quit. I apologize for going over. We all suffer from that. So thank you very much. If you stop your screen sharing, I'd like to turn things over uh, to Casey Stedman, who's going to bring us up to date on everything that's happening with Blue Origin. So Casey, take it away. All right, let's get the screen swapped here, if this will work. working on that. Okay, I'm all set. How's that look, everyone? Uh, can you go full screen with it? We'll see if we can get, make that happen. It wants to change it. Because I think right now it might be cropping off the bottom of your slides. Yeah, this is the issue with OneNote. I'll, I'll start talking and see if this uh, this will display. So my name is Casey Stedman. I'm an NSS Space Ambassador as well. And I am going to talk about Blue Origin, which is another one of the emerging commercial companies that is working on commercial spacecraft amongst a number of different markets. So first thing to talk about is they have developed a human rated commercial spacecraft known as the New Shepard. This is a, I'm going to have to go back. It's advancing without me. It's a, the New Shepard vehicle is a commercial spacecraft designed to take advantage of this emerging market for commercial space tourism. It's a suborbital vehicle, much like the, uh, Vir um, excuse me, uh, Virgin Galactic's uh, Spaceship Two, and takes advantage of utilizing suborbital ballistic profile in order to carry tourists to the edge of space, well, roughly 100 kilometers or in excess of 50 miles. The New Shepard in flight utilizes this profile, as you can see here, it's capable of carrying up to six passengers and recently flew a couple days ago to four. The booster separates from the capsule apogee. It allows the capsule to progress on a ballistic profile of coasting to a point at which it's going to remain um, as about as long as you can linger in a suborbital realm. Up to four minutes would allow the passengers to experience that sense of microgravity before descending back uh, to Earth 
under parachutes for a propulsive landing, um, as well as the booster, which is using similar technology under its BE-3 engine to return back to its landing site propulsively and is demonstrating a reusability of that vehicle and the engine that is up until now relatively unprecedented. The spacecraft itself first flew in 2015. They built several individual capsules and several boosters and tested those repeatedly. Uh, each of those flights was successful, minus the second, which was the demonstration of its in-flight uh, abort, which demonstrated well. The booster itself was lost. The capsule uh, was able to jettison away and demonstrated that the crew would have survived an abortive flight. Uh, it's powered by a single throttleable BE-3 engine, which is using a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen mixture. On its on that level, it's relatively uh, benign and traditional. However, it uses a throttleable and gimbalable element in coordination with the airspace surfaces on the vehicle itself, on the booster, in order to make a propulsive landing and fly back to its landing site. The interior volume is considerable. Uh, it's much more spacious than you'd find on some of the orbital craft, partly because it doesn't require the same number of systems, life support, RCS, or, or the like. Uh, and it also leaves open a possibility of carrying various payloads when a company opts to fly them. Um, you can see, and there'll be some videos that have come out since the uh, first flight this week with the passengers, that there was an opportunity for them to float about the cabin and experience the microgravity before returning their seats for the reentry. And they're launching at this time from Van Horn, Texas. That is their only launch site. Uh, whether they continue to do that in the future for all the tur paying tourists or move to other locations, we'll have to see. The company is very quiet about those kinds of things. Preparing for a space flight. Some of the discussions that we've had in talking about various commercial uh, entities out there is the expansion of this term astronaut or spaceflight participant and where they're going to receive their training. And per the FAA, all that training is conducted at this time internally, as long as they meet the minimum standards in order to be medically qualified and perform basic tasks, particularly regarding safety. And Blue has developed, although they're very quiet about the proprietary aspects of it, a training program internally for them to experience for simulators, practical training, and academic exams in order to go through how to function in the vehicle, demonstrate being able to release themselves into microgravity, get back in their seats, uh, and egress if there's a if there's an abort. And we have to assume that all these things are meet, met with uh, because we can't get to see the specifics. But at this point in time, we can assume that all four of the passengers that flew this week were able to demonstrate such. Their big selling point from this being a commercial vehicle and looking for the tourism aspect is experiencing space. And in this particular case, they're going to experience a lot of positive Gs in the ascent. The vehicle is traveling roughly Mach 3 all the way up to Apogee before coasting on that ballistic profile and then returning to Earth. They'll experience up to four minutes, depending on the, uh, the rate of acceleration to that point with regards to how far and how much microgravity they'll experience. You can see from the picture, the passengers seem to have enjoyed it. Once the uh, vehicle begins its descent back in the atmosphere, we'll receive positive Gs. The crew and our passengers will have to return their seats, strap in, and experience that until it comes to a point when the uh, drogue chutes pull out the mains and returns by parachute uh, to the landing. Uh, what we've seen in the videos and their demonstrations is under the parachutes, the vehicle returns to soft landing at approximately 15 to 16 miles per hour. And it uses an air propulsive jet system just before landing, just like the soy is, to create a cushion of air for a soft landing with the passengers on board. What's interesting to note, as you can see in this picture, there seems to be like a center table within the vehicle, and that's actually the projection of the abort engine into the cabin, which projects downward below the uh, shielding, if you will, of the capsule. You can see that there's a number of large windows. These are presently the largest windows that fly on a reusable human craft which allow for in the future both uh, expanding the number of people to fly on board as well as payloads that can be used for optics uh, and rack space within the vehicle if they choose to do so. The interesting part about 
uh, having this much volume is that it changes the opportunity. If you've ever seen pictures of Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and the Mercury uh, capsule going forward for so little profile, they had no room. It was a small space vehicle you can imagine and about this much uh, room for movement inside uh, as somebody strapped into a small box. So this is going to be a different experience and it's certainly something the company's capitalizing upon to sell these tickets for at this point in time an undisclosed amount of money. Going forward, we know that the company is going to begin talking and selling these tickets for the prices that they haven't quite discussed. I think this is right now, if you can afford it, uh, you can ask that kind of question. They, they have announced that at least two more of these crude flights will continue throughout the, the remainder of this year. And we can expect based on the data and procedures that they have practiced, that those will continue with the FAA mandate to, to fly through the following years until which time they decide to either retire the vehicle or move forward with an expansion. Uh, they did not say yet whether the follow-on vehicles will carry up to the six passengers they have seats for or which time that they're going to carry payloads. Up until this time, of the 15 flights that have taken place with the vehicle on, without a crew on board, uh, NASA was able to work with them through their flight opportunities program to carry untended payloads to experience the microgravity, hypergravity uh, on board. And we expect that will continue under their uh, suborbital crew program in which scientists and researchers will be able to train with their payload to fly and experience the flight profile as well. Going forward, the company has numerous other projects going on. They were recently awarded a project to look at uh, nuclear thermal engines for deep space exploration. Uh, they have been developing a, new, a spectrum of small uh, rocket engines internally, including one to be used later for lunar propulsive landings, as well as, as you can see, the new Glenn vehicle, which is an enormous reusable multi-stage heavy lift rocket. It's comparable in size to the Saturn V and capable of carrying up to 45 tons, at least according to the company's specs. It'll end up being using a BE-4 engine, which is still under development and also being sold to the United Launch Alliance for the Vulcan rocket. Um, and at this time, they haven't discussed any possibility of human rating the vehicle, but one can suspect that whatever comes forward from this vehicle in the testing and uh, development side, that they're looking for all sorts of possibilities of what the vehicle could be used for. What we do know is it's not, gonna, not planned to be used for any national security launches remaining that ULA will probably remain a almost monopoly on that part of the market other than SpaceX, which would be the primary competitor for the heavy lift market. So we don't know where the development stands. The company is very tight about that. They have shown some development and pictures of fairings as it's being developed down in Florida. We do know that they have uh, a couple of Pathfinder engines received uh, in testing. And they've also demonstrated by um, showing, giving the, several of those for their contract to ULA. But the actual launch date and future for the New Glenn rocket is, seems to be a tightly held internal secret to the company. And probably most famous for this last year for what they've, what the company has been looking at is expanding their spectrum of vehicles and, and, uh, and developments going forward. Uh, a number of years ago, in 2017, the company announced their development of what they call the Blue Moon Lander, which is a vehicle designed to be a, a new development lunar lander to carry payloads, cargo, or whatever the company desires to the lunar surface as launch off their new Glenn vehicle. This technology incorporates their BE-7 engine and looks like served as a Pathfinder prototype design spec to push forward with their competition to, uh, for the human lander system as part of NASA's Artemis program. In cooperation with Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin, uh, I believe Draper and Paragon, there were a number of uh, other contractors that bid in, as part of the national team for this. At this time, the initial award of the contract went to SpaceX and not to this national team. However, there's some speculation that the company will rebid a similar design for follow-on sustainment services as part of the continuation of the Artemis program. That is, whether they win, not, or are awarded any money remains to be seen, but it does show that Blue Origin is looking at a number of different opportunities and one can suspect potentially that commercial space flight options to the lunar surface may be available with companies like Blue Origin. 
and that's all I have. Great, thank you very much, Casey. And last but certainly not least, we have Bruce McKenzie, who's uh, going to give us an overview of SpaceX and their uh, many activities. So Bruce, uh, turn the baton over to you. Yes, thank you. So, do I have a reasonably clear screen now? Looks like it. Okay, good. Um, so SpaceX was planning a um, um, an orbital launch of their brand new um, Starship and heavy booster around this month. It might be delayed, but that's the reason SpaceX is included in this presentation. And I'm going to also in, um, talk a little bit about that and also throw in some of my personal recollections and, and uh, opinions about SpaceX. And, um, I, I think we have a variety of audiences, so um, I'll, I'll give both a few details and, and some of them. Um, it's kind of interesting to have the two richest people in the world, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, both interested in space. Um, Elon Musk has a vision of sending, uh, extending civilization to Mars, having hundreds of people go uh, at a time, uh, establishing cities, living off the land, and, and, and extending life beyond the Earth. Jeff Bezos, on the other hand, um, when he was a student at Princeton, um, uh, learned of Jerry O'Neill and his vision of orbital settlements. And this is also what the, the vision that inspired me to get involved in the field and also um, um, led to the founding of the L5 Society, which is um, one of the precursors for the National Space Society. Anyway, um, and by the way, my address is at the bottom. If you want to contact me, bruce.mckenzie at nss.org. Um, and I also want to mention that um, I'm involved with a brand new Mars University. We had given a discount to NSS members. I don't know if that's still in effect or not. Um, there'll be online courses in August. So, uh, okay, excuse me. What I wanted to say is whether Elon establishes civilization on Mars or whether Jeff Bezos establishes civilization in orbit, it's still a win for everybody enthusiastic about space settlement and the National Space Society. Um, so um, I think about probably half the audience knows far more about SpaceX than I can possibly cram into eight slides, and some of you may know, know less. Um, they've been flying the Falcon 9 uh, rocket which has uh, nine main engines in the first stage. The first stage is fully reusable. This is a major advance, uh, tremendous cost savings, and it is disrupting the, inter the, the industry. Um, they are building the Starship, uh, what it will be one of the largest um, vehicles to fly. Uh, the, 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 the useful cargo area is something like a thousand uh, cu uh, cubic meters. It can put, um, something like 100 tons into low Earth orbit. They're well on the way to development, but they have not had any flights above, any flights out of the atmosphere yet. Um, and also I threw up this slide that Elon sent his red Tesla uh, Roadster on a test flight of the Falcon Heavy, which was um, three Falcon 9s strapped together and sent it beyond the or orbit of Mars. So he has quite a flair for doing dramatic things. Um, let's see. There we go. So um, I assume people want to want the latest status of the Starship and Super Heavy booster. Um, they are being built in Boca Raton, Texas. This is right up against the Mexican border. It's about as far south as you can go in Texas. Um, and the, the, the upper stage, the Starship prototypes have flown a few times. They've had some dramatic um, destructions. I, I wouldn't say crash, I would say hard landing followed by a destructive fire. Um, <laughs> and, they, and they're just assembling their, their first um, boost, heavy booster now. Um, they have filed with the FCC a flight plan shown in the lower left where they leave Boca Chica, Texas. The booster 
pushes the starship up to near orbital speed and then returns, but I believe they're going to just land in the ocean. I don't think they're going to try to recover the booster, which is kind of surprising to some of us that follow it. Uh, I hope that changes. And then the upper stage, the starship continues um, almost one orbit and lands near Hawaii. And they also are not currently planning to recover the, the starship. So it will be an expendable test as near as we can tell. Interesting, when Starship, and SpaceX has been, um, they, they aren't too public with their plans. The plans are very fluid. We get tweets from Elon Musk giving hints. And there's a whole little cottage industry of people down in Boca Chica, Texas, who are taking photographs through the fence and trying to figure out what's going on. So it kind of layers, it bears a air of, lends an air of mystery to it. And, and that actually might improve the press coverage. Um, that's, that's it for the current events. Um, and, but, but let me go into more details about SpaceX as a company. It's got a variety of financing. Initially, Elon Musk started PayPal, um, got a lot of money when PayPal was sold. Um, and they've gotten investors, um, they're selling launch services uh, of commercial satellites and government satellites. They're resupplying the space station. So this is a this is steady cash flow coming in to finance the new developments. Um, they have sent people to the um, International Space Agency. One of the interesting um, ways of financing, um, there have been a lot of proposals for reusable launchers or very large launchers that would have very large capacity, but the market would have to expand, the, the, uh, the market of satellites would have to expand. That is, there aren't enough satellites that companies want to fly to take advantage of a massive booster or a massive increase. And what Star, um, SpaceX has done is they've, they've started their own business called Starlink, which actually provides a demand for their launchers. So they're increasing launch, launch capacity at the same time they're increasing a launch demand. Uh, these are, um, uh, th th these would be thousands of small communication satellites for internet access around the world. And so that is hopefully gonna be a steady supply of cash to pay for the excess boosters. I think they've um, launched about 14 flights this year. They were just Starlink. I get the impression that whenever they have a booster ready to go, if they don't have a paying customer, they launch a few Starlink satellites. At least it seems that way. And they also fairly recently got a NASA contract for a lunar lander pictured in the lower middle uh, for almost $3 billion. This will obviously help finance the development of the Starship, especially uh, they'll need life support for the NASA astronauts who are going to the moon. Um, it, no, Note that there's been a legal challenge to the award of this contract from um, Jeff Bezos. Um, and I think it's kind of ironic that this vehicle is very oversized. Um, the contract only calls for them to ferry astronauts from the so-called lunar gateway down to the lunar surface. Um, and they have just a tremendous extra capacity in this uh, vehicle. Um, some personal recollections. Um, I met Elon um, at a Mars Society conference before SpaceX was um, formed. Um, he had just um, gotten a lot of money from selling PayPal. And, and these are um, some notes from me that some people might be interested in, especially if you haven't been following the industry. He was born in South Africa. He said he was not terribly political but when it came time for the required military service, he didn't really feel like standing on a creek on a street corner with a rifle enforcing apartheid. He wanted to come to the United States and, and get a job in aerospace, but it was easier to go to Canada and then go to the United States. Um, he tried to get jobs at aerospace companies in the US, but none of them wanted to hire a non-US citizen. They all had civilian projects that he could have worked on, but they wanted to be able to move the engineers around to work on government contracts or, or classified contracts. So Elon Musk could not get a job in aerospace. 
the end result was he got rich in, uh, in, in, in the internet and then founded his own company. And now he's competing with the same companies that he had applied to, to for jobs. Um, anyway, at the time I met him, he and Bob Zubrin were uh, proposing a, what one of the names was Mars Gravity Biosatellite. It would put mice in orbit, spin them for um, the um, simulated Mars gravity, and then um, uh, see what the effect does, uh, of, of the Mars gravity was. Um, he also wanted to um, send a small greenhouse to Mars and demonstrate that you could grow plants in a closed greenhouse on Mars, a very tiny greenhouse. Uh, he, he, tr he tried to buy launches for these two projects and he, he, he basically couldn't. He even went to Russia to try to buy surplus ICBMs and he couldn't buy them. And he, that's when he realized that just that the, the cost of launch was just so significant that maybe he should go into that business. Um, okay, there's a, uh, um, SpaceX has not released details about how they might outfit the cabin on the Starship. It's possible that they just, you know, are too busy to, to, uh, to plan it or it's off in the future. Um, they, they, there's a sort of an interesting little hobby of, out of drawing uh, possible um, cabin arrangements for the Starship. So if you get on the internet and do an image search for SpaceX Starship cabin or interior, you find a lot of interesting designs. Um, here are some designs that I've worked on through the Mars Foundation and um, for a, um, a three-level habitat that could be built inside a, a Starship, a greenhouse, uh, use them as a, 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 a post for a hangar or for a solar furnace. If people are interested, uh, we can hold design workshops within NSS. Okay, um, two slides about why I think SpaceX is so successful. Um, one is the technology is just ready. People have talked about reusable vehicles in the past. The shuttle was nominally reusable, but it really didn't save any money because it had you know, the cost of refurbishing. I personally worked on the Kistler uh, plan for a re reusable launcher, and it would have been quite feasible. This was in the mid '90s, um, but uh, they they couldn't get another round of investment, and the market probably was not there for a fast reusable vehicle. So that project died. Um, there have been major advances incorporated in the Raptor engine. This is the engine on the Starship that will use um, um, super cooled methane. They're going to do refueling in orbit. We've learned how to do that, um, transferring fluids to ISS. They also switched from composite construction to simple steel construction, just to keep the cost down and, and steel stands up to the uh, temperature better. Um, I, I said there were proposals in the past for reusable vehicles. There have also been proposals in the past for very large vehicles. Um, I have a picture in the lower left of a proposed Sea Dragon launcher was so big, it, it, the proposed vehicle was so big, you'd have to build it in a shipyard, tow it out to sea, launch it from there. Um, under the left image is a white image of the Saturn V for size, size comparison. Anyway, the, many of these proposals for massive amounts of cargo to orbit just were not feasible in the past, either economically, technically, and now I think the time is right for it. Um, SpaceX is also successful because of Elon's personal vision, he's got charisma, he has experience managing um, fast-paced entrepreneurial companies, he's got the credibility of managing Tesla, which is now one of the most valuable uh, automobile companies in the world. Um, so he has no trouble getting the attention of investors and good employees. Um, there's a joke that used to be going around in the space field. The way to make a small fortune in space is to start with a large fortune. Um, Elon has started with a small fortune and so far he's turning it into a larger for fortune in, in, in Tesla. And he seems to be willing to um, uh, devote a lot of that money into um, 
um, SpaceX. He has publicly stated he wants to devote half his fortune to extending life beyond the Earth and the other half to improving life on Earth. And they're also willing to iterate very quickly, uh, switch to a different design, uh, abandon their uh, composite tanks and build metal tanks, um, rearrange the flaps on the vehicle, things like that. There's a lot of established companies or government agencies who just wouldn't make those changes quickly. Also, in closing, for better or worse, SpaceX is willing to take risks. Um, and this means that they can um, you know, hopefully um, have successes. Uh, the Falcon 9 was certainly a major success. I hope Starship will be a success. But they're putting so much into it that if it fails, the company would be uh, horribly crippled. They basically have bet the company on multiple projects. And so far, they've all worked out. So that's it for me. Uh, my address is at the bottom, Bruce dot Mackenzie at nss.org. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That was excellent. I really enjoyed that, uh, particularly your personal insights. Now, I do have a question for you that I'm actually going to repeat that same question for Casey and Loretta as well. And so I'm going to ask everyone here to put on your venture capitalist hat, and you're looking to make a business prediction uh, about the future of the company that you were speaking of tonight. And I was going to say, what do you see as being the biggest threat to your business's success? Is it going to be A, another competitor that is particularly threatening? B, the market for your products does not develop as expected, or C, will it be uh, the adverse regulatory environment changes? I add that last one because I just read that now there's a proposal to put a special tax on people who want to be space tourists, and that calls to my mind uh, the luxury tax uh, that the Democrats in Congress passed. I think it was about maybe 40 years ago. Uh, it was a tax on anyone who wanted to buy a yacht. And the consequence of that tax was that, of course, it was only supposed to affect the rich. But the consequence was the rich stopped buying yachts and because of the loss of business, the ship slash boat building companies wound up having to lay off their blue collar union employees who promptly went and complained most loudly uh, you know, to their elected officials that they were the ones actually paying the price. So uh, is it, a, a competitor, B, the general market, or C, a regulatory changes that you see as having being the biggest threat to each of your companies. So Bruce, you want to start okay, off? Yeah. Um, Jim, that was such a long question. I'm not sure <laughs> I can remember the beginning of it. But as far as yachts go, um, Jeff Bezos apparently has an immense, immensely large yacht. You might search for it on the internet and see what you find. Um, let's see. Um, the Chinese have announced that they are going to have a build a massive reusable vehicle that looks basically identical to Starship, I understand. And um, SpaceX has pretty much stopped filing patents because they don't want Chinese competitors and other foreign companies from um, uh, using their ideas. So they're, they're, they're switching to trade secrets, as, as I understand it. Um, let's see, there are regulatory problems. Um, SpaceX has repeatedly done things and then um, apologized to regulators afterwards. Um, um, e um, Elon said some things that on, on Twitter that he should not have said that the Security and Exchange Commission was, um, uh, you know, called him on the carpet for, um, let's see, the FCC said they, I'm, I'm sorry, FAA said they, they shouldn't build their current tower high enough to, to service the Starship. 
um, things like that. Um, they have to close the road at Boca Chica more often than they originally told the regulators. So um, they, they're not the nicest neighbors in terms of waiting for approval. On the other hand, they want to move fast and, and you know, the other companies wait for approvals and it takes decades to do something. So anyway, um, another risk is um, SpaceX might just do something very risky and it, it, and it wouldn't work out. I personally think Starship will work out um, because they have some very good engineers and it looks like um, everything's sound on that. Um, at least work out for cargo and refueling. So, okay. Um, and um, also the uh, um, congressmen and various government agencies like NASA want to have two suppliers. So Congress is looking for some way to help the American companies that are competing with SpaceX catch up to SpaceX or, or at least stay in the race. So, um, um, but anyway, um, um, I won't say any one of those is, is, is the biggest threat um, but I think the one that they worry most about might be China. All That's right. All. Thank you, Bruce. And I'd like to remind our attendees that if you would like to ask one of us a question, please use the Zoom Q&A feature. So Casey, what is your perspective uh, with respect to Blue Origin? Is uh, the biggest threat to them uh, either another business like SpaceX or, or will it be markets don't Develop to support their business plan, uh, or are they more susceptible to uh, adverse regulatory changes? That's a really good question. And I, I did a little reading on that before we started. And I think that uh, honestly, the regulatory process probably isn't as a great a threat at this time because they've adhered at least to the uh, whims of the market and have complied with the RFIs for the various competitions that they've uh, submitted proposals for, but the real challenge is uh, both a, the weight of the time of development for the various products and seeing a, another company, in this case, particularly SpaceX, push on this, those same market trends and kind of get ahead of them. Uh, one, of the, one of the key uh, features for New Glenn was going to be able to launch uh, a considerable mass of payloads for the OneWeb uh, satellite network in the same market that Starlink is, uh, has achieved. Uh, clearly, the new Glenn vehicle is far behind in development. There's concerns with the uh, BE-4 engine, and that's affecting ULA's launch uh, future as well with their Vulcan rocket. So not only is Blue a little behind the curve on, on direct competition, but they've pushed uh, against kind of some innovation in early trends that SpaceX pushed for, in, with regards to the human landing system for the Artemis program as well. If there ends up being a follow-on sustainment or, or, the, or the current uh, bid process is sustained for the HLS contract now and Blue and its uh, national team partners are able to recompete, they may see some uh, positive trends coming there. But they are there is a, uh, a sensibility right now that the, the company is in a lagging second place as far as uh, being able to keep up with the available market. Whether the, the world can support multiple satellite internet connection uh, providers is, you know, kind of, we don't know that answer yet. Uh, somehow, uh, even though the GPS signal is now available to any user that can have a receiver, multiple countries have launched their own GPS similar networks uh, to various degrees of success just so that they can have some proprietary element of it. So it's possible that OneWeb, Blue, and, and some of these other companies that are put, like Kuiper for Amazon, are pushing for the availability to compete in that same market will allow those companies to go forward. But that's that's a little bit too far in the future to be seen. I don't, I don't foresee them failing as a company because I think that they've, they're starting to break into some of these other pieces of the market, particularly these development side for NASA and Space Force and DOD. But it's hard to say where they'll compete commercially. And as far as their suborbital tourism as, a, as an emerging portion of the market, I think 
if if what they're saying is correct and that they have a backlog of people willing to throw money at, put at the product to go, then at least for several years, they're going to hold a bit of a niche um, with only uh, Virgin uh, Galactic as a particular competitor. Okay, thank you, Casey. Uh, uh, Jim, if I could yes, add, um, sure. um, Jeff Bezos has also said he intends to finance the company to the tune of a billion dollars a year from his, his wealth with Amazon. So even if they change direction, they still have enough spending money to do something, no matter what direction they go. And that, and that's for what the next hundred years or so, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, okay, Loretta. So in light, you know, of uh, what we've heard about uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX, how do you uh, rate Virgin Galactic with uh, respect to exposure? to competition, to maybe the market not developing, uh, or to regulatory changes? Well, there, there's some good indications that, that the market is going to be fairly strong, but uh, I think they're, um, it, it's a matter of, of competition, as particularly from Blue Origin, and also uh, the new space perspectives and their Starship Neptune, which is a um, a balloon launched gondola that takes you um, above 99% of the atmosphere and you get the view almost like you see behind me here. You, you see the, the thin band of atmosphere in the darkness of space. And those tickets are only selling for $125,000. So, and, and they're getting close to, to operation. Um, so, so I think competition is going to be very uh, important for, for Virgin Galactic, but also I think part of their difficulty will be their limited vision that they founded the company just on, as a suborbital company. They have no vision of going orbital, at least to the extent that I can tell, uh, except with their Launcher One vehicle, which is a different company, you know, they'll launch small satellites, but Virgin Galactic itself is strictly suborbital. And it is not scalable up to um, an orbital type of, of launch. So that I think their their biggest limitation is self-imposed. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Abby. Uh, thank you for your kind words, Abby. And she has a question for all three of you, which I think is a a good question. What do you, each of you, think? the primary motivation to develop space transportation systems is for each of these companies. So Loretta, what would you say the primary motivation is for Virgin Galactic? Well, I think their primary motivation is space tourism. Although they're, they're trying to stress their ability to carry experiments instead of tourists, uh, because that that's certainly going to be a, a separate revenue stream that, that they're relying on uh, to help them carry through. So they're, um, yeah, it's, it's suborbital tourism is, is the main, main driving factor for them. Uh, Casey, how about uh, the same question for Blue Origin? That's real, that's interesting because their uh, founder, uh, Jeff Bezos, really is pushing, like he said, for that uh, in-space industrial community and presence. Um, and it's interesting to see you following like the HLS proposal and their BE-7 use of the engine there and the throttleable conditions and the, and the repeated use and testing of the, uh, the precision landing on New Shepard, you can sort of follow a trend within the engineering process that blew was kind of casing on this space tourism element as a means of uh, revenue, even if the vehicle isn't necessarily useful for a lot of deep space roles or even NASA contracts. Uh, that said, of course, they are paying, flying some untended payloads for that NASA as well. But the idea that these are all scalable pieces, and they have said that the BE-3 and some of the tech that was used on New Shepard would be part of the upper stage for New Glenn. So 
I, th I see it all as an incremental testing point toward whatever long-term goals the company has. And of course, like you said, they have the capital to stay long-term. They can continue plugging along nicely without ever having to win any more contracts. Although it'd be advisable to remain as a competitor in order to do so. So whether there's a, an altruistic intent or a, a, a bit of a, a capital a investment and development side of this, I think that uh, I think blue is straddling the line for both of those. Okay, and Bruce, how about SpaceX's motivations? Um, so motivation for, um, uh, for, for transportation. Well, Elon has publicly stated his motivation is to expand civilization to Mars, you know, cities on Mars. And many of his key employees are also interested in that. Um, in order to get practice and funding for it, um, well, 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 to get people to Mars, you have, you have to first send cargo to Mars. It's nice if you could practice somewhere else, like low Earth orbit, asteroids, moon, NASA and the US government are willing to pay for sending spacecraft to the moon. So SpaceX will take that money and, and develop lunar landers that are remarkably similar to the Mars landers. Um, and um, then in order to get that step, they, they are developing the Starship that'll, that'll carry uh, massive payloads to low Earth orbit, the Falcon 9. They've, they've learned a lot about reusability with the Falcon 9. So it's this incremental approach, the long-term goal will be Mars and then all these incremental goals of, of you know, larger and cheaper on the way there. That's all. All right, I'm gonna uh, field one of the questions that uh, a person uh, who submitted it through the webinar registration asked and I'll, if anyone here has something to add to that. Uh, how do we reduce transportation costs? Uh, my first take on this is via the reusability route, as well as being able to have a high sustained flight rate so you can better distribute your fixed costs. Uh, does anyone have anything they would like to add to that answer? I, I think I, a bit of that's that's right. it. it is the, the frequency of launch I, virgin galactic is trying to develop additional spaceports around the world and and they're looking at hopefully getting to a point where they can have 400 flights a day um no excuse me 400 flights a year <laughs> mm -hmm. but um so they're um they're trying to, to develop that ability to, to have frequent flights, with, so, which would, you know, sell more tickets. Um, so, so Jim, I agree with you. Um, uh, the, the key is reusability and frequent flights. Um, but let me, as I pointed out earlier, um, SpaceX actually created their Starlink subsidiary in order to have more frequent flights I mean, you know in order to get paid by internet subscribers for more frequent flights that's all okay. uh, another question that we had come in via zoom registration what does the end of this decade look like for the space economy um actually uh i would recommend people go on the web and do a search on the quoted phrase space economy outlook and use the site option to limit your search to bea.gov they have a, a a nice document out there that provides insights into the united states component of the space economy um Growth has lagged that of the overall economy and the projections that they are using uh, kind of present the space as a lagging growth sector. And I don't know that I agree with that, again, because of the fact that they're probably relying heavily on historical 
growth rates and with the developments that we're seeing with uh, the growth in the commercial sector, particularly for launch and other associated services and the dropping of launch costs, which broadens the market base, uh, I believe that the BEA is under, that's the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, I believe that they are seriously underestimating uh, the potential growth rate for uh, the space economy of the United States. So uh, I'd like to hear uh, your perspectives on that. Uh, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on that aspect? Uh, last year, I took a course from Georgia, I'm sorry, Florida Tech in conjunction with uh, ISU under uh, Andrew Aldrin's uh, Educational Institute. And one of the uh, resources that we had available was Bryce Space uh, okay. Economic uh, Estimates, Graphical Data and whatnot. And they all seemed very positive. Uh, they were looking at upward trends. And I think it kind of depends on the, the sector. Uh, there's there's far too many people that look at space and only look at the launch vehicles and, and space as, access part of it. There's a whole other sector that's only concerned about sat, satcom and uh, telecommunications, and that hasn't fallen through on any part. That that's certainly people are making money there, and there's new tech and there's availability. And there's far more launch vehicles available now than ever before to make give new companies access to it if it's available. Uh, I think that. The long-term vision of this idea of a human presence in space is still a bit premature to, to define as a, another aspect of it, but certainly we're seeing positive, I think we're seeing positive trends. If not, if the data is not there, then at least the perception is that the, uh, the industry is a, it has a growth or growth potential. But I think that, that there's gonna be, you know, troughs and waves as, as regards to how profitable that might be or how, how many opportunities truly exist, particularly when uh, certain sectors are monopolized or regulated to a certain point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bert, I am gonna ask one last question and then turn things over to you. And this was also a question that came in from one of our Zoom registrations. And it's a really good question. And I think I'm just going to, turn this one over to the panelists to answer. What are the next steps and plans for broader commercialization of space? So who would like to take the first stab at answering that? Uh, Jim, I'll take a stab at that. Dave Dressler, I don't know if we should let you talk or not. Oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so Axiom's getting ready to launch a module to the space station that's going to do a lot of space manufacturing and other research heavily in the commercial sector. And that's going to open up horizons. And Axiom's long-term plan is to basically remove that module from the space station and become an independent mm -hmm. space station. So. When you see activity like this, you know that things are really starting to boom. And, uh, you know, we have, um, we had uh, Peg Whitson as one of our speakers for the virtual ISTC, and she's going to be on the second mission to the space station. So uh, really be nice to get her to the ISTC that we're going to have in um, National Landing next May, hopefully after she's flown and, and hear about that experience. But uh, uh, Mike Safradini is the CEO of Axiom. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at trying to get him to ISTC as well. And uh, MLA or Mike, Mike Miguel Lopez Alegrea is going to be the first mission commander, I believe. So um, to hear what these folks are doing in terms of commercialization is going to be instrumental in setting the direction overall for industry moving into space like Jeff Bezos wants to see. Uh, so. And with uh, Axios, they have contracted with, if I got, is it uh, Alina or Athena? It, it's an, the Italian company that has built uh, components for ISS. Alina Thales, I believe, is the company name of them, not too seriously mispronouncing it. Uh, and Suffaradini uh, was for a long time, quite high up in the ISS uh, management 
chain uh, at NASA. I had met him at, oh, this is a good time for play. I was going to say I met him at one of the ISS R&D conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, this year's conference is actually going to be virtual, and it's August 3rd through the 5th. There's no fee to register. So if you have a serious interest in the types of science that's going on on the ISS platform, as well as commercialization aspects, I'd encourage you to, uh, I'd have to go look for the link. You may just, just do an, a search on ISS R&D conference uh, and check it out. The schedule is online. Uh, I can highly, I highly recommend the conference based on my experiences with the live conference. Um, it, Jim, it, Dave, if, uh, don't leave yet. Um, it sounded like you were giving a plug for ISDC. Uh, why don't you tell the audience what is ISDC and when and how do you go? Okay, it's our annual event for National Space Society, the International Space Development Conference. Uh, we've had it for going on 50 plus years. Oh, wait, no, 30. Well, since 1980 something. 1982. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, things get uh, jostled up because we've had these two years of pandemic. So, um, but we're finally going to get back in action uh, next May. And it's a pretty cool event because we'll get the top names in the industry. We'll get astronauts to show up. Uh, usually we get a large group of students. We don't know if we get the students this year because a lot of them are from overseas, but it's a great opportunity to get face to face with the experts in the industry. We'll get people from NASA headquarters like Jim Green and uh, a lot. I shouldn't speak out of turn. We need to invite those folks yet. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I, I, I anticipate a, a really good roster of uh, people to meet and greet. Well, that's where I met and had a chance to actually speak with both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Uh, yeah and to absolutely. actually be able to sit and talk with them for more than high and shake the hand was uh, really nice because they were both very interested in talking about their vision for space uh, and uh, their businesses and what, what they were doing. And there's been any number of very, uh, a, a great lineup of speakers uh, that cover a lot of uh, ground, so. Okay, and Bruce is asking for dates and it is actually going to be uh, preceding Memorial Day weekend in 2022 and National Landing is near the airport, uh, Reagan Airport in Washington, DC, or basically Arlington. And it's gonna be at the Hyatt Regency there, which is a really nice venue. Last time we were in DC, we were in kind of a constrained venue, but this time we'll have lots of space. Yeah, so thanks for asking. Appreciate that, Bruce. Okay, thanks everyone. I think I'll, uh, Bert, do we have time so that each of our speakers can make one brief closing brief closing comment? Why don't we do that? We're already a little over, so, it, so I don't see any problem going just a few minutes longer. So why don't you do that? Okay, and my brief comment is, Thank you, everyone. I very much enjoyed it. And thank you for your questions. Uh, Loretta? Well, I'll just throw in a, a little bit of information here about space tourism. About a year ago, Virgin Galactic had a, a um, survey conducted by Cowan. And they found that the Virgin Galactic's addressable market is 2.4 million people. That is people who have a um, net worth of, of $5 million or more and that 39% of those are interested in paying $250,000 or more for a ticket on Virgin Galactic. So even though they are limited to suborbital space flight, um, it looks like there's a good market and they already have contracts for research flights as well. So they're the little kid in the group, but they're gonna do all right. <laughs> How about you, Casey? I'm just gonna plug my uh, little corner of the space business. The one of the things I think that uh, has come out from the commercial space uh, enterprise and this advent of vehicle, suborbital vehicles for tourism that well that meets the the public's perception. I think there's a great great deal of uh, lack of focus or misunderstanding that there's a role for science from these vehicles mm -hmm. and that uh, right now both Blue and Virgin are contracted with NASA to fly both tended and untended payloads for the suborbital profile 
And I think that's going to make a huge difference because it's, you can't stick a person on a black branch uh, on, and launch it from the uh, Georgia coast there for NASA, but you can ride in these vehicles and carry your payload with you. And I think that's going to change a lot of things about perception and the core people who are out there to become professional astronauts. Yes, uh, I agree totally. I, I think it's shameful that the media has turned a complete blind eye to uh, the research aspects uh, of the associated with all of these businesses uh, and just focusing on the, the space tourist part. Uh, Bruce, final word? Well, Jim, I want to make a comment on that. The fact is that they'll have extremely fast turnaround time for these experiments. So they'll get results in record time instead of waiting for things to come back from the space station. Just wanted to get that pitch in there. Um, yeah, so the, the only life we know of is on Earth. Um, we may be the only intelligent life um, in our corner of the galaxy or, or conceivably the universe. It, um, and uh, we should get out there. We should use the resources of the solar system to expand, um, you know, build habitats, be they orbital settlements, lunar, Mars, whatever. I happen to favor Mars because you've got the volatiles there that you want to eat and breathe. Um, and um, so it would be a shame if, if we stayed limited to the Earth. Yeah, so we are the consciousness of the solar system. Let's go out and, and uh, you know, explore and, and find new places to live. That's all. Wonderful. Two thumbs up in, in agreement with you, Bruce. Uh, Bert, I will turn things over to you now. Okay, thank you so much, Jim. And, and thanks for taking over for me uh, at the beginning when I had some technical difficulties. I think I've done more than 40 of these and that's the first time I was ever just disconnected and I was doing a really great job on my intro, but everyone missed it. So, and I'm not gonna go through that now, but I wanna thank you so much, Jim, for hosting and moderating today. Uh, it was a really, really great and informative session. I'd like to thank our, our panelists, Loretta and Casey and Bruce, just really great discussion. And it, it was nice to see all of them lined up against each other to see how they compared, contrasted and gaining some insights. So, a very informative session. So I thank you so much for doing that. I would like to thank my colleague, uh, Larry Ahern, uh, in help in, or as always, in organizing these great space forums and town halls, and our support, uh, Dave Dresser, and of course, uh, the great uh, Fred Becker, who is always doing a great job in running uh, our sessions. So, so thank you all so much for another great uh, space forum. We'll see you again. I know you didn't see my my uh, intro, but we'll see you on August 5th uh, for a discussion of the SLS. And you'll be seeing more about that uh, in an email invite. So everybody, I just wanna wish you a great evening for those of you in this time zones. And for those of you in the morning, a great day ahead and a great weekend, stay safe. And we'll see you again on August 5th. Take care, everybody. <laughs>